the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once there was a woman who set out to discover the meaning of life. First, she read everything that she could get her hands on, history and philosophy, psychology, and religion. And while she became a very smart person, nothing she read gave her the answer she was looking for. So she, so she set out to find other smart people, and she began asking them about the meaning of life. Her discussions with them were sometimes long and lively, but no agreement was ever reached until she, and she still had no answer. Finally, she put all of her possessions into stories and set off in search for the meaning of life. She went to South America, she went to Australia, she went to Japan, she went to India, she went all over the world. And in all of these travels, she still could not find the meaning of life. Well, not to her satisfaction, anyway. Eventually, she heard about someone who did know life's meaning. She was told that he lived far away in a high and distant village in the Himalaya mountains, in a little hut perched on the side of the mountain just below the tree line. So she went to go and tried to find him. She, she crossed rivers, she forded streams, she scaled mountains, she climbed and she climbed and she climbed to reach his little shack. Finally reaching his front door, with hands so cold they could hardly work, she knocked. A kindly looking old man opened the door. She nearly fainted with happiness. At last she had found him. I come halfway around the world to ask you one question, she said, gasping for breath, not even taking the time to pull off her coat. What is the meaning of life? Please come in and have some tea, the old man said. No, 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 I, I mean, no, thank you. I haven't come all this way for tea. I am here for an answer. Tell me, tell me, please, what is the meaning of life? We shall have some tea, the old man said. So she gave up and went inside. While the old man was brewing the tea, she caught her breath and began telling him about all the books she had read and all the people she had met and all the places that she had been. And the old man just listened, mostly because he had no opportunity to get a word of edgewise. <laughs> As she talked, the old man placed a fragile, teacup in one hand, and he began to pour the tea. Well, she was so busy talking that she didn't notice when the teacup was full. So the old, old man kept pouring and pouring until the tea ran over the sides and spilled on the floor in a steaming waterfall. What are you doing? She yelled as the tea began to burn her hand. It's full. Can't you see that? Stop. Stop. There's no more room. Just so, the old man replied. You come here wanting something from me, but what am I to do? There's no room in your cup. Come back when it's empty, and then we'll talk. Wanting to be made complete by increasing her knowledge, her ability to understand the world and ultimately the meaning of life, the woman came up short. When opportunity finally came that she was looking for, <coughs> she missed it. She essentially couldn't find the forest for one of the trees. This is kind of like how Nicodemus came to Jesus, wanting to know just who Jesus really was and where his power came from. Now he and Jesus didn't have the tea ritual, but the outcome was basically the same. Jesus, uh, Nicodemus came looking for a, a spoonful of knowledge, just enough to keep him going, but Jesus, Jesus gave him buckets full. Nicodemus was pretty sure that Jesus, this Nazarene rabbi, had been sent by God. I mean, after all, no one could do what Jesus did unless God was very much behind it. 
So Nicodemus essentially asked, what is God doing by sending you here? How does God, how does this change things that now that you are here and, and with us now, what is God saying because you are here? Now remember, this was a Pharisee talking. A learned man, a priest, a person deeply, deeply concerned about his faith and, just as importantly, the tradition in which he was raised. Bringing himself to the one person, the one person who might, might be able to answer this basic question about God. Now Jesus' initial answer was direct. He spoke to Nicodemus about God. He told Nicodemus that unless you become born again, or our translation says born from above, you might as well give it up. Well, all very well, Nicodemus said, but how are you just supposed to pull a thing like that off? How are you supposed to do that if you're pushing 65? How do you get born again when it was a challenge just to get out of bed in the morning? I'd like to think that just then, in the midst of their talking, a gust of wind happened to whistle by and making the dying embers of the evening fire burst into flame. And Jesus said that being born again was just like that. It wasn't something that you did. The noodles, the, the wind did it. The spirit did it. It was not something you do. It is something that happens. How can this be, Nicodemus said? And that is when Jesus let him have it. I can, I can almost hear Jesus saying to him, listen, Nicodemus, you may have six honorary doctorates and a half a column and a who's who, but you can't grab, if you can't grab something like this, well, then you better go back to kindergarten. Jesus is saying to him, I'm telling you like it is. I am telling you what I have seen. I'm telling you that, that there are people on Medicare walking around with love lights in their eyes. I'm telling you that there are ex-cons that are teaching Sunday school. I am telling you that there are undertakers that are scared silly that we are going to put them out of business. I am telling you that God has such a thing for this world, such love for this world that, and all of the people in it that I have been sent here. So if you don't believe your own eyes, then maybe you'll believe mine. Maybe you'll believe mine. Then maybe you won't come sneaking around scared half to death in the dark anymore. We'll come to, we'll come clean, come to life in all of his glory, in all of his goodness. And Nicodemus is breathing. It got faster and faster and faster, and his heartbeat got, got faster and faster. Why, why he hadn't felt like this since his first kiss. Since the time his first child was born, or the time they told him, hey, you don't have lung cancer, you just got the flu. You understand? This is what the story of Nicodemus is all about. <coughs> the story of Nicodemus is about Jesus filling his emptiness. Even though this man came to Jesus thinking he was pretty full. You see, what, what eventually fills Nicodemus in the end is an answer that is far larger than anyone possibly could have been looking for. Did you hear what Jesus said, my brothers and sisters in Christ? Did you hear how this conversation that started talking about belief quickly moved to talking about trust? And then after all that conversation, after all those words, we hear the punchline. The punchline that comes in verse 16. Probably the most single important verse in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish 
but may have eternal life. Jesus is there to save us. Whether our journey in life consists of simply floating down a calm stream or navigating rapids, Jesus is there. Jesus says, put your trust in me. Watch me, trust me, travel with me. And I will be with you each and every step of the way. And when we get to the end, when we get to the end, well then, then we'll stop and have some tea. The poet laureate of New Hampshire by the name of Don Hall went to his grandfather's attic after his grandfather's death and found stacks upon stacks upon stacks of old boxes. He found one box that was filled with little short pieces of string. The box was marked in, a, in an old hand. String too short to be saved. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. His first book was titled this. The box of string totally took him off guard. And from his off-guardedness and his unguardedness, he wrote a beautiful poem about it. So I ask you, have you ever felt like you were a string too short to be saved? If so, then you can begin to come to know what it means to be accepted by God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In God's great attic were all pieces of string that have been saved. Nothing is ever lost to God, nothing. Not a single teenager who commits suicide, not a single child burned to death in a train wreck, not a single woman who dies of breast cancer, not a single homeless lady or, or, or homeless man or bag lady, not a strange spouse, not a wayward child, no one, no one is lost to God. Oh, we may appear too short to be saved. Many, many times in our lives we may appear that way. But God will still save us. Because this is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.